Good evening, everyone, and welcome to One Healthy Boston's Facebook Live. I'm Kristen Perfetio. Whether it be worn out knees or sore hips, how well you move can affect your ability to work, play, or do everything in between. And that's why I am thrilled to be joined with Dr. Michael Ayers, a orthopedic surgeon from South Shore Health tonight. We are going to talk about joint replacement surgery. Are you a good candidate? What does it entail? What's the recovery like? Dr. Ayers is going to do his best to answer your questions. So we definitely want to invite all our viewers at home to send in any questions about this topic. And he's going to do your best to give the answers. How are you? Very well. Thanks, Thanks for, for having joining me. us. We're so thrilled to have you here. Let's just get right to it because I think we're going to get a lot of questions about this hot topic. You know, there are so many joints in the body. When we talk about joint replacement surgery, what exactly are we talking about specifically? Well, most commonly replaced joints would be the hip and the knee. Um, the shoulder is also a fairly popular joint to replace. Um, there are other joints that are replaced, but they're sort of uh, less common. Ankles can be done and are sort of up and coming in popularity. And then there's a lot of sort of less commonly replaced joints. But basically, we're talking about hip and knee replacement followed by shoulder replacement. Okay, and, and you do a lot of these surgeries. What common, you know, is it knee that you see most or hip replacements most or one way out the other? My particular specialty is in hip and knee replacement, so that's mostly what I do. I have a couple of partners that do shoulder replacement, um, and that's the, the bulk of what we do. As I said, ankles are, are, are something that's done fairly commonly as well. Um, but maybe not quite so much. Okay, so what would lead um, somebody to even consider having joint replacement surgery? What causes all of this pain and ache and wear and tear? Well, basically our joints are, um, you know, the parts of our body that move and support us. Uh, the cartilage of the joint is basically a shock absorber and um, it sort of absorbs the force of life. And for various reasons, uh, diseases, wear and tear, trauma, all different things can cause a joint to break down. Uh, this happens over time and eventually it leads to pain, stiffness, disability, and, and at some point that gets to the point where it really affects someone's quality of life and they become a candidate and uh, joint replacement can really be something helpful to get them back to their life. What, what common um, you know, condition do you normally see? Is it arthritis or mostly sports related, that kind of thing? The most common cause is, is arthritis. Um, it's kind of like all roads lead to Rome. I mean, at the end of the day, when the joint wears out, it's arthritis. And there are a lot of subtle reasons why. Sometimes there can be a shape. Someone, um, some people have bow legs. Some people have knock knees. Uh, the degree to which that happens can sort of accelerate wear, things like that. So there's a lot of different factors. But at the end of the day, when the wear gets to a point where it's causing enough pain, it becomes a, an option to do a joint replacement. Okay, so getting to arthritis, you know, how does arthritis damage joints to the point that they actually do need to be replaced? Well, the cartilage is a living structure that kind of coats the end of the bone. And when that, that molecular structure breaks down, it, it wears out and eventually it, it no longer is there. When we talk about bone on bone, that means when the cartilage that was between the bones no longer is there. Um, and along the way, there's, there's different phases that it goes through and there can be inflammation and pain and people will work through these with non-operative means but at some point most people it comes to a point where they just can no longer tolerate it and that's when we have a good solution in joint replacement. Okay we have some questions. Um, Rosimer still has pain five years after knee replacement. Any advice for her? Well knee replacement is a, is a great surgery and it, it, it effectively relieves pain in probably 95 percent of people. That means that five percent of people may have some issue. Uh, whenever you have pain after joint replacement, it uh, needs to be sort of worked up systematically. There are definitely reasons why uh, knee replacements can cause pain. There can be problems with the surgery. There can be um, things that go wrong. There can be other things. I mean, we replace the surface of the bone. We don't replace the tendons. We don't replace the ligaments. So people with knee replacements get tendonitis. They get bursitis. They get all sorts of other things around their knee that can still cause pain. Um, so that's one of the things that it's not a total knee replacement. Uh, it's replacing the bones, but there's still a lot of other structures that can cause pain. So usually when something like that happens, it requires kind of a systematic workup to try and figure if there's a fixable reason for the pain. And sometimes there is, and sometimes, um, you know, like with anything else, there are some knee replacements that don't work as well as others. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't know it was just the bone. I thought it was a whole bunch of other stuff there too. <laughs> Several commenters have said that they, um, they have replacements coming up, and how should they prepare? That's a good question. How do you prepare for something like this? Well, I think that, uh, as with many things in life, the, the less surprises you have, the better. So we actually like patients to prepare by um, really becoming educated about what they're going to expect. So on knowing what to 
um, expect before the surgery, during the surgery, after the surgery, knowing what to expect when they get home, being prepared. We, you know, ask them to look at their home, remove scatter rugs, do things like that, preparing around the home. Um, most high volume surgery centers, places where joints are kind of done or have some kind of a class. So we like patients to go to the class, learn about the surgery, learn about what to expect. Um, and we also like patients to have a care partner, someone who's gonna work with them, because if they okay. go to the class, they might not remember the questions to ask or things like that, and having a partner to help them all helps a lot. Okay, is this a last resort type of procedure or are there things that people should try before they get to this point? Joint replacement is a, is a very good procedure, but it's a procedure that should only be considered when most non-operative means have been exhausted. So, um, you know, it starts as easy as medications that are over the counter, uh, moves to exercises, uh, sometimes you know weight loss or discontinuing aggressive activities can help. And um, we have smaller but invasive things like injections can be helpful. Mm -hmm. In certain circumstances, if people have mechanical symptoms, arthroscopy, a smaller surgery could be helpful. Uh, so in general, it is a last resort. It's a good surgery, but not something that you jump to in the beginning. Okay, Deanna asks, is there an age limit? Um, no, there's no age limit when we, um, do joint replacements, I like to think we, we evaluate the patient outside of their age. If patient is uh, active enough and suitable enough to have the surgery, then they should have the surgery. Age is one of those funny things. I mean, there are some people who are in their 90s who are very active, and there are some people who are very sick in their 70s or 80s. So we individualize that. We don't age discriminate on either side. We do joint replacements on some young people who need them, and we also do them on um, very elderly people. But I'd say for the most part, it's sort of, you know, the bulk of our patients are in the 50 to probably 80 range. So age isn't necessarily a limit, but is there a window, if you will, of when is a good time to have it done, or can you ever pass that window where it's like, you know what, we can't do it now. It's your knees or your hips are so bad, we can't help you. Yes, uh, it's usually not that the knees are so bad, but what will happen is if people are at a, maybe in their 80s and they're pretty healthy and they don't want to have the joint replacement because they say, I, I, I don't want it, I'm too old. Uh, we almost have the conversation. If we look at people's life expectancy now, if they don't have a bad disease, it can be pretty long. So sometimes people who are 85 have a 10 or 15 year life expectancy. Mm. So they have to ask the question, yeah. you have to have this knee for the next 10 years, are you going to be happy with it? So sometimes people might be better off taking care of it then because they can collect small medical problems that, while well, not including the surgery, might make the surgery more risky. Okay. Michael is 33 years old and he's nervous his replacement won't last. Will it? Um, nothing lasts forever. Um, <laughs> so joint replacements are, are uh, mechanical items. They do wear and uh, most will wear out. I think the encouraging thing is they, they wear at a, at a sort of predictable rate. And at 20 years, probably 80% of them will still be functioning well. Um, so uh, if you're 33 and you have a joint replacement, it's a reasonable worry, but not something to keep you up at night. I mean, you had your joint replacement to live your life, so live your life. The good thing is that if there's a problem with the joint replacement, we're pretty experienced in fixing those problems. And people yeah. do have revisions and people yeah. have, have multiple revisions. So it's something that you need to just sort of do the best you can to take care of yourself. And at the end of the day, get it checked every five years just so you make sure that there aren't any small problems that can be picked up. But other than that, you can't really stay up at night worrying about it. <laughs> we, um, I know you talked about age just a little moment ago, but um, Priscilla was told that 58 is too young. Is that true? Um, as again, I wouldn't age discriminate. If you're uh, 58 and you have end-stage arthritis, uh, if your quality of life is affected, if you've exhausted all um, non-operative means and you have an x-ray that shows advanced arthritis, you're a candidate for joint replacement. Mm -hmm. There's not really a, a, a too young. Okay, and I think she also asked, do you test for metal allergies before surgery? This is an interesting one. Yeah, it is interesting, and we don't test for metal, metal allergies. It is there's exceedingly limited um, research to show that metal allergies uh, cause there to be problems with joint replacement. So we, we don't go looking for it. There are some cases where we have people who have severe metal allergies where we will look for an alternative joint replacement. There are a couple of options that um, don't have a perceptive amount. Nickel is usually the, the uh, element that people are, are sensitive to. So we. It's not so much a problem with hips because we can do hips without that metal. Knees are a little tougher, but there's a way to avoid it. But frankly, um, there's very little data to show that that actually is a problem. Okay. Julie wants to know, um, do they replace elbows? Yes, absolutely. Elbow replacements are done. Um, I don't personally do them, but uh, <laughs> I have done them before. They are not... Um, 
you know, probably as durable. There are other options for elbows that, that might give relief from arthritis, but at the end of the day, there are elbow replacements. The challenge is if you did an elbow replacement with someone who is young and physically active, it might not be the best uh, fit. Okay. Um, so with knee or hip replacement that you do, with these types of procedures, how do you qualify success? Um, typically pain relief, mm -hmm. uh, return to you know a, a decent and acceptable quality of life. Um, we don't, you know, qualify it as people being able to, you know, run the marathon mm -hmm. or, or, or not that people do do that, but we don't, we don't kind of look at it that way. But it's usually getting back to most normal activities of daily living. Are there any types of limitations for the most part? I mean, somebody who works, you know, in carpentry and is on his knees all day, would he be able to get back to that again or not? People do get back to heavy labor after their joint replacements. Mm -hmm. um, we usually recommend that people avoid high impact activities, so we okay. dissuade them from running. Uh, we dissuade them from any kind of you know contact sports, but um, you know we do when we gonna, if we're going to send people back to a, a job that involves a fair amount of, of heavy work, we just advise them to be careful and cognizant of what they're doing, and um, you know try to limit things a little bit. Okay. More common sense. Okay. Well, th that makes sense. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> do any patients have issues? Um, uh, can, uh, can I'm sorry. Do any patients have issues after surgery? or continuing, I guess, with their lifestyle after surgery? Um, you know, surgeries, obviously, there are, are, yeah. are often issues after surgery. Most of them are, are they, they resolve, but mo most folks, uh, the, the odds of joint replacement being successful are about 95%. So nine to 10, nine and a half people out of 10 are gonna have what they consider to be a good result from their surgery. Problems do happen, there are risks to surgery. Um, it's not perfect, and there are certainly uh, people out there that are gonna have problems. What I tell people is when they go to the grocery store, um, they're going to see tons of people walking around. A lot of them walking by them have joint replacements. The fact is the people who have joint replacements that don't do well, understandably spend a lot of their time talking about it. And, and that's mm -hmm. only natural. So you hear a lot more about the bad joint replacements. You have to remember the odds mean that there's a lot of people walking around that just walk by you that had a great joint replacement. 95% is a huge success rate. Yeah. You must hear a lot, or do you hear a lot, folks saying, I wish I had done this sooner. Yeah, I think a lot of people will say that. You know, I think uh, when, when joint replacements are successful, people are very happy with them. One of the other things that's interesting to remember, though, um, we talk about joint replacements. People usually will do well within a few months after surgery, but a lot of them actually make more strides over the first year. So sometimes the recovery isn't instantaneous, and sometimes it does take a little bit of time for people to sort of get accustomed to their joint for all the swelling to go down. Obviously, people are different, and people's reaction to surgery is different. So some people are better really quickly. Other people, it takes them longer. So we do sort of preach some patience with folks, and we usually tell people if, if you're not feeling, you know, you're, by a year, you should make your maximal improvement. Okay. Melanie wants to know, can more conservative treatments be used first, specifically injections or, and I have no idea how you say that word, Eflexa? Euflexa? Euflexa is okay. a commercial name for one of our glucosamine chondroitin products. So oh, okay. the molecules of cartilage are glucosamine and chondroitin, and they're, uh, they've formulated them into some injections, and there are a number of different brands of it, and we inject that into the knee. It was devised uh, over 20 years ago with the intent of regrowing cartilage. It never actually did that, but... In studies, it did provide pain relief for some people. So it's one of the tools in the, the armamentarium, if you will, of treating this disease non-operatively. Mm -hmm. So we will try it. Um, it's not covered by all insurances, and the data behind it isn't great. I'm sort of a firm believer than any port in a storm. So if, <laughs> if you have a, a bad joint and you're suffering from it, you know, as long as it's not dangerous to try, you know, try it. People do diet changes. People, you know, try natural supplements. Those are all worthwhile to to, to try. If that relieves your pain and you can delay a joint replacement, well then that's that's good. Okay. Michael wants to know any risks for redo procedures? There are lots of risks for redo procedures. Whenever mm -hmm. you redo a joint replacement, um, especially if you're you know, taking out parts that might be attached, there's always risks of fracture. Um, by its nature, the redo procedures have higher risks. And the, the results, while often great, are not going to live up to the results of the first time around. Okay. And Barbara wants to know, have there been improvements in knee replacements in the last two years? The knee replacements themselves, the mechanical parts, haven't improved greatly. Um, and the thing that people need to remember is if you have something that's even 90% successful, 
it's really hard to improve. If, if you took a test and you got an A and someone asks you if you want to take that test over again, you'd probably say no. So we're trying to improve something that's really good. So we have to be careful to improve that very incrementally and around the edges. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard to just take something that good and say, hey, I have a new one. You know, it, it's not necessarily going to work that way. But we've made great strides in improving the experience, um, improving our pain relief, mm-hmm. um, you know, doing small things that, that aren't necessarily the implant itself, but to do with the way we do the surgery, the way we spare our tissues, um, the medications that we give patients, and sometimes less has become more, um, the way we mobilize people. So we've done a lot of things around the edges um, to make it a better procedure. A colleague of mine asked me today, I know this may be a little high tech or maybe further down the road, but um, what about stem cells? Has that been being used at all for helping to grow cartilage to help with that replacement? Yeah, I mean, the, the to, on the uh, topic of cartilage growth, we mm-hmm. actually do have the science to be able to grow cartilage mm-hmm. and to implant that into knees and to get, it's not exactly cartilage, but it will fill a void and it works. It works in younger patients with sort of distinct injuries. Okay. When we talk about arthritis, usually this is a process that's been going on for many years and the joint is deteriorated and those cartilage replacement procedures don't work for that. Okay. Okay. Stem cell, uh, another one of a series of, it's called regenerative medicine. There's a Mm. lot out there. It's kind of the new buzz. Um, It's interesting. Insurance doesn't cover it. It's expensive. We do it. Um, Again, any port in a storm, if um, it's safe and it's approved, I think it's reasonable to try it. I don't agree with people pushing it and and overselling it because it's expensive and, you know, it should really, people shouldn't be mortgaging, you know, their whatever in order to get something that probably doesn't have a whole lot of results. Proven. Okay, gotcha. We're getting a lot of questions about ankle replacements. Are they done? Do they work? And what about soft tissue issues? We can start with the first one. Are they done, first of all, ankle yes, replacements? Yes, ankle, ankle replacements are definitely done, and they are. They were not 90% successful, so they are, with each generation, getting, getting better. Okay, and okay, so do they work? And what about soft tissue issues? Well, um, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, you can put your hand on your side of your hip and know that there's a lot more of you around your hip than around <laughs> your ankle. The ankle does not have a lot of soft tissue around it. Yeah. So um, the, the sort of protective environment isn't, isn't as thick there. So the risk of infection are more of a worry, not to say that they're necessarily higher, but they're more of a worry. Okay. Do any patients have bad luck with hip replacement? We've talked a little bit about this. Every surgery is different, right? Yeah. So if uh, 95% are successful, 5% are going to have a problem. There are many reasons why you could have a, a less than um, perfect joint replacement with hip replacement. Hip replacements, um, in, inherently, it's two parts that are mechanical. They can come apart. That's a dislocation. The parts can loosen. Um, infection is something that is out there in our world, and, and joint replacements can get infected. It's a horrible tragedy, but it's something that, that can happen, and it, and, it, and it does happen. So these are all things that we, we worry about, but again, um, you know, not necessarily a good reason not mm. to do something that could give you a lot of relief. Okay. Knee replacement surgery, how long is the procedure about? What do are, what are people expect when they go in for that? The surgery itself, the, the technical parts take you know anywhere between an hour and a half and two and a half hours, depending on different factors, um, you know, roughly speaking. Okay. And then um, a day in the hospital, a couple of days in the hospital, how is, what's the recovery process for that like? It's actually knee replacement and hip replacement are both becoming outpatient surgeries uh, throughout the country. They are done outpatient. Uh, for the right patient, okay. um, a fair you know fair amount of my patients will go home on day one, day two. It's becoming rarer to have people stay three days in the hospital. Okay, and then hip replacement. How long does that procedure last? It's about the same. A really, hip replacement, about ninety minutes. Okay. Again, it has a lot to do with body habitus. If if someone uh, you know a hundred and twenty pound um, person versus a four hundred pound, yeah. it's a different different operation. And, and how quickly are you getting these people up and moving? I mean, I think most people think, oh, hip replacement, joint replacement, I'm not going to move for a few days. You want to get them going, right? Yeah, with our joint replacements now and some of the newer techniques with pain relief and uh, kind of local pain injections that we have around the surgical site, most of our patients are up the night of surgery walking. Um, they're able to go to the bathroom themselves that evening. This builds a lot of confidence. Now, Sometimes it's a little bit of a honeymoon period. Once that local medicine wears off, there, there <laughs> tends to be a, a little bit more pain. But by that time, we've usually got them on some sort of a balance of medicines. Um, so most people do do fairly well. Not to say they don't have pain. This is a painful operation for a few weeks, but but there is definitely um, 
uh, a lot of motion early on. And are they getting right into therapy right away within that week? Yeah, I mean, in the first week or so of uh, joint replacement, the therapy is basically motion. And we say therapy, we want, you know, we want people to get up and walk. Um, that's a good way to avoid complications, avoid complications of, of um, you know, kind of chest things by being breathing, avoiding any blood clots by mm, moving your legs. Right. But we're not doing weightlifting in the first week. It's okay. mostly just motion. Okay. Beth wants to know, why don't they remove the kneecap? Uh, hers broke a month ago after surgery in a fall. Um, the kneecap's a very important um, little bone. Um, when you go to lift your body up from the ground, the, the kneecap is actually a fulcrum that you use. It's a, it's a mechanical lever that allows you to lift your body weight. So without a kneecap, people um, can't walk as well. They can't step up as well. So it's very important. We usually, um, the kneecap is, is frequently replaced. When we say we replace it, we resurface it. We cut the arthritic part off the undersurface and we put a plastic um, component on. But when you feel your knee in the front, you're feeling your own knee. The part that we replaced is underneath. Okay. And Tom wants to know about elbow replacements. I, we know we talked about it earlier, but can you just repeat what we talked about with that? Sure. Elbow replacements are done. Uh, they're effective. There are um, certain other surgeries uh, where they can remove some extra bone and do some other things in the elbow that sometimes can give pain relief prior to needing an elbow replacement. Also, elbows like shoulders, I mean, we, we, they're not weight-bearing joints, so people can sometimes live with more arthritis in their elbow than they could in their hip or the knee because it's not, it's not under, you know, some may have a bad elbow when they do heavy labor, but once they stop doing heavy labor, the arthritis might not bother them as much. Okay. Robin wants to know, do you use the Mako, M-A-K-O robot? Any robot? Like um, I don't use any robot. I mean, the robotic technology is, 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 is very good. Um, yeah, the question becomes uh, when you have something that's 95 percent um, effective and you have a robot that costs, costs a million dollars, <laughs> is, is it necessary? Um, it's scientifically interesting. It's, it's a very uh, you know, cool piece of equipment and it is done. Um, you know, is it a better replacement? That really hasn't been, been borne out and proven just yet. Okay. Um, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Does it make a difference what type of facility or hospital that you go to for these types of procedures? I mean, some people tend to gravitate towards hospitals that do these things all the time, others not. What do you think? Well, I think that, that at most hospitals you could have a successful joint replacement. Um, there's some literature to show that, that higher volume um, is important, uh, probably not highest volume, but at least a place that... Um, you know, does this frequently. Mm -hmm. You, you want to go to some place that, that has a program. I mean, we talked about some of the educational items and things like that. So having a place where there's there's people who are set up to do this procedure, where there's a team approach. Um, when I do joint replacement, I, I do the surgery, but I've got people who work with me, scrub techs, um, assistants, nurses who do this, this every day. So there's sort of a a trained and qualified team, and, okay. and that's something that people should look for. Okay, that's what actually was going to be my next question. What are the types of questions that they should be looking to ask their doctor before they go down the road for something like this? I think those are, you know, just what's the what's the program, what what's the support, what kind of, um, uh, you know, things have been set up to, to work with and handle these patients. Um, you know, I think the therapy, you know, is important uh, in the hospital, and, and, you know, they should, they should, mostly feel comfortable with their surgeon. I mean, I think it is a personal thing. If you're going to have joint replacement surgery, you're going to, you know, have a relationship with a surgeon. So that's probably the first thing. Do you have a comfort with them? And then, um, you know, it's it's the age where people can find information about people if, if, they, if they want to. And it's yeah. you're going to, you know, probably wise to do that. Because there is a lot of follow-up afterwards, correct? I mean, I would imagine it's not just surgery, one and done, see you, we're not going to check in anymore. They, they do have follow-ups with you after, correct? That might vary, so that, <laughs> some, that might be a good question to ask. Yeah, okay, good to know. Lolita wants to know, if you are overweight, is it more difficult to recuperate from these types of surgeries? Uh, yes, it is, and I think if, um, if you're overweight, that's that's part of the equation. I mean, when we talk about arthritis and extra weight, it puts extra force on the joint. So weight loss is one of the things that can help arthritis. Now, people will usually get into a situation where their arthritis is already pretty severe. And at that point, the weight loss isn't probably going to cure their arthritis. But what happens is, um, depending on, when I, we say overweight, usually we have a, a term called bone mass index, where people okay. get to a certain point where if, if their bone mass index is, is high enough, then their risk for surgery actually go up. So the risk for complication goes up. 
the risk for infection with a wound, the risk for postoperative complications go up. So we are concerned about it. It's one of those, uh, we mm -hmm. call it a modifiable risk factor. Um, you know, and bariatric surgery is one of these things that is uh, becoming safer and, and, and more popular. You guys did a, mm -hmm. did a thing on that earlier yeah, this year. Yep. Um, there are some cases where it may make some sense for someone to have bariatric surgery and then six months later have their joint replaced. Okay. And what other co comorbidities are you concerned about? Diabetes, heart diabetes disease? Diabetes is very important. Okay. And it kind of tags in with the, uh, the uh, weight a little bit, but diabetes increases the risk of infection and complications. Heart disease increases your, your body's you know, ability to handle the risks of surgery. Um, that's important. Uh, any pulmonary things can be important. So in, in generally, we want to maximize all of these risk factors and get people as healthy as they can before they have the surgery. All right. Terry says or has, is asking, what hospital and where do you work? And um, how is the best way to find a doctor to do this kind of stuff? <laughs> well, uh, I work at South Shore Hospital, South Shore Health System, which uh, you know, I just hear. And, you know, there's a lot of hospitals that do this. So we're, we're in New England. We're um, you know, there are major medical centers and, and good hospitals throughout, so you don't have to go very far to find a, a good joint replacement surgeon in and around Boston. There, there's a lot of them, so. Okay. Uh, Charles wants to know if you have any advice for, and I'm guessing this is rheumatoid arthritis in the shoulder. Well, I mean, rheumatoid arthritis is, a, is one of the things that can lead to the, the destruction of joints. It does it in a different fashion. Rheumatoid arthritis is a condition of the lining of the knee where the lining, uh, it's an autoimmune disease, so the lining of the knee actually overreacts against itself and there, there are sort of erosions and the, the joint breaks down. It's a medical disease, so uh, rheumatoid arthritis can actually be treated medically. There are a lot of medicines that can suppress it and, and give people relief. And uh, 20 years ago, we used to see horrible conditions in rheumatoid arthritis. With mm. some of the newer medicines, we're not seeing, we're seeing rheumatoid arthritis treated and controlled better, so sometimes the joint doesn't get, get quite so bad. But at the end of the day, all lead, all roads lead to Rome, and if the rheumatoid arthritis gets bad enough, joint replacement becomes a solution for it. Cortisone okay. injections also work along the way, so there there are multiple treatments. I think in a case of rheumatoid, it's usually treated by a by a rheumatologist, and then at the sure. end of the road, they would see an orthopedic surgeon. Okay, um, Craig, can arthritic treatment help with sports injuries? Sports injuries, um, it depends on the sports injury. I mean, I think when we think of sports injury, we think about meniscal tears and um, ACL tears and things like that that often are treated surgically. What happens is that injury, as the years go on, will set in motion something where the joint will, will decay. So someone may have a, a bad sports injury and then 20 years later need a joint replacement. So okay. there is that kind of continuum. But usually if there's a sports injury in a younger person, that would not necessarily be treated by a joint replacement. Okay. And Don wants to, he says that his joints click. Does he need a replacement? My joints click. So, yeah. So, so um, every, everyone's joints click. That's sort of a normal phenomenon. And we usually tell people if it, if it doesn't hurt, I mean, if you have a, a noise or a click or a pop or a crunch in the joint that's painless, I, I wouldn't worry about it. Okay. Uh, are patients on braces or any type of devices when they leave to help them walk or, you know, move around a little bit? Anything like that? Not after joint replacement. Um, now, interestingly, before joint replacement, braces can be a treatment for arthritis. There are some people who can get some benefit by something called an unloaded brace. But after we do the surgery, um, the, the surgery and the joint replacement is stable. It doesn't need to be braced after. Okay. Um, getting to uh, just talk a little bit about like medications following surgery. How long can anyone basically expect to be on any type of pain meds afterwards? Most, Most of the time, time within, within within a week or two, people are, are off pain medications. As as you know, there's been a big uh, mm -hmm. kind of the, the medical field is was probably at, at fault for overprescribing medication for a while, and we've moderated that. Um, and you know, we're pretty attuned to the fact that these medications, if they've taken for more than probably 30 days, they don't work as well. So we try and limit it. Everyone's different. Obviously, there are some people who need no pain medication, and there are some people who need more, so we try and individualize it. Okay. Are they on blood thinning medications at all, too, or does that vary with certain patients? Hip and knee surgery both carry a decently high risk of uh, blood clots after surgery, so everyone okay. gets some kind of treatment. Um, we have gone on orthopedics to a more of a use of um, Lesser medications like aspirin for healthy patients to, to reduce the risk of blood clots. But again, those comorbidities, if people have a history of a blood clot or another medical condition or they smoke or something like that, that would be something they need a heavier blood thinner. Okay. And getting to recovery, um, where do most people go after their hospital stay, if they even stay in the hospital? Home. They, home is best, correct? Home is the best place to go <laughs> for patients. Yeah, yeah. 
there are there's a small subset of people who either through physical or comorbid medical reasons or social reasons need to go to um, a skilled nursing facility or, or a rehab facility but um, that's less and less the case most people who uh, do some preparation mm -hmm. look at their home beforehand talk to their family members can do quite well going home okay and um, for those who may not have a loved one or someone to take care of them at home would a visiting nurse be an option too to come go home and check their dressings and help with that yep, yep. visiting nurse is quite common uh, commonly employed they come to the house and, and you know provide that service um, it's actually there have been some studies that looked at, at people going home alone and actually they, they do they do well I mean it's, it takes a lot of support though okay. um, in my practice we use a sort of a computer uh, app that allows us to keep in touch with people and, and allows them to communicate with us and I think little things like that where we can kind of give the patient the sense that they have contact and they can ask questions and provide that support. Okay. Debbie and Sim, Sim have, have a question. Still have pain a year after replacement. Any advice or suggestions? You know, I think if, it's, if you're still having troubles after a year, uh, that deserves sort of a systematic uh, workup. So basically, you know, someone to listen to what your pain is, uh, do a good exam, maybe do some testing certainly there are there are problems that sometimes can be fixed but it's got to be kind of a systematic approach where you kind of look at all facets of that joint and see if there's any anything that is um change that you can change and you can improve sometimes there isn't and sometimes you know you have to ask the question are you better now than you were before your joint replacement um if you're not then that's unfortunate some people they're not as good as they want to be but they're still a lot better than they were and and you know, that's sort of an important thing to keep in mind Okay, uh, I know we asked, I asked this question with you earlier about um, people who kind of tend to put it off and then they say, oh, I wish I had done it earlier. Do you get a lot of patients too who come in to have one knee done or one hip done and then they're back a year later to get the other one done? Because the one that you've worked on feels so good now, right? Yeah, I think the threshold for people, the, yeah, the first joint people, there's a lot of intimidation and fear associated mm. with a joint replacement. I mean, and let's face it, once you have a joint replaced, um, can't ever give it back. I mean, it is kind of a life-changing event. You now have a joint replacement, and that that's that's a big deal. So people are legitimately frightened and, and maybe don't jump right in. Once they have a successful joint replacement, you know, when they come in, they're like, I'm ready for the other one now. Let's go. So that they know. Okay. Uh, Robert wants to know if you could please repeat the summary about shoulders and that type of procedure. Sure. Um, Shoulder replacement uh, is something that's commonly done. Um, just like the elbow or the wrist, we don't walk on our arms and hands, so usually people will go longer before needing a shoulder replacement. Um, they're, but they're very successful uh, surgeries. Shoulder replacements typically are for more for pain relief as opposed to function. Um, they're not maybe as uh, good for heavy labor, so mm -hmm. people might might sort of wait and then have their shoulder placed when they stop the heavy labor. Okay. Um, last question. So this is what I want to ask you, your soapbox, if you will. For someone who is at home and uh, considering a knee or a hip replacement has been living with this for a while, you know, what would you tell them? You did say fear is, is sort of a thing. Should they be fearful of this or not? No, I, I think it's more a matter of... Um, you know, sort of in, engaging with someone who, who does these procedures. And, and we see people usually for a period of time a lot before their joint replacement. So we might care for these people for two or three years okay. before they actually have a joint replacement. And I will always tell them, you'll know when you're ready. I mean, if you, you need to have bad, a bad x-ray, you need to have, you know, pain, but patients need to be at a point in their life where they, they sort of cry uncle and say, yeah, I'm done, I'm ready for this. Okay. So it's a very individual decision. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was some Thanks really valuable me. information tonight. We want to thank everyone who joined us and for sending in our questions. We also want to thank WCVB for hosting us and South Shore Health. For those who missed this Facebook Live, you can tune into WCVB's Facebook page. You'll see it there as well as, well as OneHealthyBoston.com. Um, thank you so much. You're Again, we'll see you next month.